He's mad as hell. It's Kevin O'Sullivan. Yeah, welcome to What Just Happened. And my special guests this week are showbiz correspondent extraordinaire Rebecca Toomey. Welcome, Rebecca. And far less extraordinaire, backed by unpopular demand. I keep trying to get him to stay away, but he's come back. He's sneaked in. It's JJ Anasiobi. Uh, a lukewarm welcome back, mate. Yeah, well done. Now, uh, let's get, get the ball rolling uh, with a few of my thoughts on that now a uh, famous New York car chase uh, involving Harry and Meghan. Uh, was it just me or was there something distinctly weird about Harry and Meghan making a song and dance of their little contretemps with the paparazzi in New York? Was this the moment the gruesome twosome let the mask slip as it became uncomfortably clear they crave attention and will do anything to hit the headlines? I could be wrong. Perhaps their alarming story of a traumatic two-hour car chase through the teeming streets of Manhattan, putting lives at risk, was terrifyingly true. It was, according to the Duke and Duchess of Netflix's spokesperson, near catastrophic. The key word there being near. That's like saying it nearly rained. Nearly catastrophic means not actually catastrophic. And that's not the only element of this tawdry tale arousing suspicions that we have been subjected to another example of Meghan's truth as opposed to the truth. Did this allegedly frightening pursuit by six cars full of photographers really last more than two hours? As our semi-royal heroes maintain, New York Mayor Eric Adams doesn't believe it. Ten minutes max, he said. The taxi driver who'd found himself with a couple of VIPs in the back insisted the alleged drama all unfolded at low speed and it was no big deal. And while the NYPD cops have confirmed that the Sussexes took refuge in at least one police station, they say the entire insignificant saga was nothing more than just a bit chaotic. The sort of scenes we often see when the snappers are out in force to get pictures of celebrities. No one is condoning the unreasonable hounding of famous people by the media. And of course we sympathise with Harry, who when he suffers the slings and arrows of cameras flashing in his dazzled eyes, must think of his tragic mother Diana. But lest we forget, Princess Di's death in that Paris tunnel was not caused by the paparazzi, but by a drunken driver who was off his head on oceans of booze. Nevertheless, all due respect to a still grieving son who, with some justification, believes his mum was badly treated by the Lens army that followed her everywhere she went. But if the petulant prince thinks we fully accept his dramatic version of events that night in Manhattan. He's got another thing coming. I'm not buying it, and nor are millions of other sceptics who grow wearier by the day of Meghan's constant attempts to, as they say in Hollywood, control the narrative. I say that for some strange reason, their royal limelight-loving highnesses exaggerated what really happened. Why? We can only speculate. Perhaps it was to yet again portray themselves as multi-millionaire, private jet-travelling, mansion-dwelling victims. Oh, how we weep for them as they scream from the front pages or whine on TV that their privacy is constantly invaded. A complaint that is hard to take from Harry, an emotionally incontinent bleater who told us all about his frostbitten genitals amid the avalanche of intimate revelations in his spiteful little book, Spare. If he can't even keep his privates private, how can he stamp his entitled feet about intrusion? But perhaps the Manhattan hyperbole was to maintain their currency as one of the most talked about couples on the face of the planet to fan the flames of a minor incident and turn it into a global sensation, which, in fairness, kind of worked. Do Harry and Meghan fear that if they're not in the news, they might fade from view? Are they starring in their own melodrama? You decide. There's no money in obscurity, or perhaps it was pretty handy for Harry as he sues the Home Office in a bid to persuade the British cops that when he returns to the UK, he deserves full pleasure protection. I know I'm just a cynical journalist who has seen it all before, who has seen agents and public
publicity flunkies arranging for the stars they represent to be greeted by baying mobs of photographers. It's part of the fame game, a game that I believe Meghan and Harry play with consummate skill. Do they really want to be left alone? Do they hell? <laughs> I mean, come on, uh, JJ. I know you love Harry and Meghan, <laughs> but they do like the limelight, do they? Come on, answer. <laughs> it's only taken five episodes for us to finally properly disagree on something. And this one, I can... You're okay. so off Good. the mark. I've been trying this to one. do this for weeks. <laughs> you have. And you finally achieved it. Well done. You can have, have a gold star. Excellent. Look, there, it was um, near catastrophic because there were paparazzi going on the pavement. That's not a falsehood. That's been said by the paparazzi themselves as well. That was also said by the NYPD. Paparazzi on the pavement. They could have uh, run over someone, uh, a pedestrian. So that is, that is true. It wasn't a two-hour chase, but the ordeal from when they left and Papa's chasing them to when they finally got home was about two hours. And in New York, I know you've been there, I know you used to work over in the US as well, it's possible that for 50 metres between blocks, there's a clear run, and then they get to traffic lights and it's a red light. So that could have been the paparazzi chasing them. And uh, some of Harry and Meghan's personal security, who are, who are like veterans, they're like ex-Navy SEALs and this yeah, kind of yeah. thing, they have said they've never seen anything quite so chaotic in all their lives. Well, yeah, but, but Rebecca, I mean, you know, as I said earlier, if you say uh, uh, it nearly rained, it actually means it didn't rain. <laughs> yeah. So when you say near catastrophic, that means it wasn't catastrophic. <laughs> there was, we know that no one was hurt. Yeah. There were no collisions. Uh, and that everybody else's story is rather different to the gruesome Jason story. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's my point. There's something strange about this. I think these two are writing their own scripts and starring oh. their own melodrama. Well, I am a Meghan fan, but for some people, 10 minutes in Meghan's company might feel like two hours. So maybe it's an <laughs> oh. interpretation. I am a Meghan oh. fan, oh. but for some people, it might feel like that. Yeah. <laughs> but really, I think if you have to look at the reporting of news stories in America, it is always over-dramatised. It is always a 10-minute car chase becomes two hours. And if they're in New York, they're, you know, they're reacting to what happens in New York. But as JJ just said, when you look at footage of how someone like Britney Spears could not even drive down the road with the amount of paparazzi in front of the car, and that was very slow moving, I can just imagine how terrifying it was. And her mother was with them. And it's just like you said earlier, it does have a horrible echo of history repeating itself. Yeah, there is, there is that element, and we all due sympathy to Harry for that. Every time he sees a bank of photographers, he must think of his mum, and his mum was unreasonably hounded. Mm. However, you know, this strikes me, this uh, near-catastrophic alleged car chase, uh, I think it was just a n other scene where you see all the time celebrities, a uh, few snappers trying to get pictures of them. No big deal. These two have written this up to the stars and turned it into the chase of the century. You, you, you know, like Steve McQueen in <laughs> Bullet or something. <laughs> I just think it's a bit odd that these two people are definitely gilding the lily, making it uh, a more of an exaggerated situation to get talked about. I think they want to be in the headlines more than anything. They could just walk down the well, street. Well, why didn't they headlines. just shut up? They didn't have to say, oh, we've just been in a near catastrophic <laughs> car chase. If they just shut up and went home, nobody would be talking but about them. And that would be their worst nightmare. No, because then, then what happens next time? The paparazzi do the same thing again. Now they've spoken out about it, the paparazzi will be more careful next time. This won't happen again. They won't, though, will they? <laughs> no, no. Never more careful. Uh, it is time now for a bad ad. What does your handwriting reveal? Unknown health problems, secret fears, unnatural desires? Handwriting analysis is an accurate science that reveals facts about you that you don't even know. Now you can have your handwriting analyzed. Call this number and have pen and paper ready. Handwriting expert Ernest Garfield will uncover your hidden self. Follow simple directions and respond by pushing the buttons on your phone. Dollar ninety-five per minute. Under eighteen, get permission. Uncover your hidden self. Call now for your personalized handwriting analysis. Yeah. <laughs> handwriting analysis is an accurate science. So can I just take you up on that? It's not. Uh, and secondly, what they said, you know, find out whether or not you got unnatural instincts. <laughs> Great. I'll definitely give you some money to find that out. <laughs> yeah, this letter is written in blood. So I think there's some natural yeah. instincts right there. But when we were young journalists, yeah. much younger than you were when I you were a young journalist. Yeah, we were younger than I was when I was <laughs> yes. a young journalist. Yes. You mean even when I was a young journalist, I was very old. <laughs> yes, yeah. get me. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, Don't I argue I with seeing, that. I remember seeing in the papers. 
we would have we would analyze people's handwriting to determine yes. what kind of person they were. You'd have a, a huge double page spread being like, well, when it was person. a slow news day. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it used to sell. Yeah. So I think a lot of people would have called up for this and and uh, well, yeah, they'll, they'll make money out of it, but there's a load of old cobblers. <laughs> I'll tell you that. What they do in uh, France when all their handwriting is identical in France? So they just say they're all the same. Is that all what? their handwriting? Yeah, they study that, that's, that's a bit racist. That oh. I'm not having that. Yeah. It's not a kind just, of show, they, mate. They, they, Are you stereotyping? Yeah, I won't have that. Disgusting. It is time now, though, uh, for my fan mail. I think Rebecca's got some fan mail. It's anti-social media. Take it away. <laughs> Kevin O'Sullivan should shut up shop. <laughs> he stopped serving the people. <laughs> What do you like? Uh, <laughs> beans? Yeah. I don't think it's my job to serve people things in shops. Anyway, I've stopped serving the people, apparently. That's what happens when you worship <laughs> Anthony Fauci. <laughs> uh, was he ever put in front of a camera? I barely know who uh, Anthony Fauci is. He's, he's the American chief medical officer. <laughs> uh, here's another one. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan criticised Keir Starmer's speech on the NHS before it actually happened. <laughs> yeah, it's fair bet, isn't it? <laughs> be <laughs> might as well say so in advance. Saves time. Uh, this <laughs> boomer is a blatant liar. I hope he never needs gallbladder surgery. <laughs> well, I hope that as well. <laughs> Very kind of you to ask. Uh, right, my third one uh, is this is my favourite. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is part of the. Illuminati. What? <laughs> the f Illuminati. <laughs> he is not one of us. <laughs> nope, not. Uh, he's had more COVID jabs than Bill Gates. Where did that come from? <laughs> and how do you know how many <laughs> COVID jabs I've had? This is your doctor. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, clearly, yeah. Stop giving me COVID jabs. <laughs> I've had enough. Uh, well, anyway, that's that's my fan mails. You've got some as well, uh, Rebecca? Yep, I have to read them off my phone. Yeah, oh, well, good you good should have had the phone ready. <laughs> All right, I'm well, to be, trying to know. be professional here. Well, we, we try our best, <laughs> yeah, don't okay. we? So the first one I have for you is, this is one of my favourites, OK? Yeah. The woman, this is referring to me, yeah. is talking she is just looking for trouble as she probably can't get a real man. <laughs> How do they know? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. think we are kin. Well, that's a good friend of yours, yeah. <laughs> that was from JJ. Uh, so, sorry about Rebecca. She turns out to be a bit of a racist. <laughs> uh, we're trying not to have any racists on the show next week. Uh, and uh, we've still got JJ and the COB even worse. Uh, let's go for a proper break now. What just happened? He's mad as hell. It's Kevin O'Sullivan. He took over the sinking helm of Scotland's answer to the Titanic after Nicola Sturgeon committed political suicide by backing the insane and downright dangerous decision to send a double rapist to a woman's prison. No one doubted that as the new leader of the downwardly mobile Scottish National Party, the hapless Hamza Yousaf had a mountain to climb. Cruelly, critics nicknamed the former call centre worker Hamza Useless. Unfair and below the belt, perhaps, but now we're sure as hell finding out why. After Nicola, Queen of Scots, self-destructed and disappeared down the rabbit hole of trans ideology gone mad, it looks as if Hamza is determined to follow her on the rocky road to oblivion. The altar he has chosen to die on is a 53-year-old butcher named Andrew Miller who kidnapped and sexually abused a poor little girl in a terrifying 27-hour ordeal. This excuse for a man was also found to have hundreds of indecent images of children in his possession. Uh, Miller pleaded guilty to rape and await sentence, which we fervently hope will be an extremely long one. But where will he serve his time? That is the question. Because this disgusting, depraved individual likes to dress in women's clothes and identifies as a woman called Amy George, he says he's transitioning. So what? Albeit a semi-human one, Butcher Boy is a male, a bloke, a man, and must therefore be sent to a man's prison, right? Not so fast. 
The First Minister of Scotland is not so sure. Incredibly and outrageously, Mr Useless is refusing to confirm that the appalling Miller is destined for a male jail. So just like that other rapist in a skirt, Adam Graham, who wants to be known as Isla Bryson but can stick that where the sun don't shine, sex monster Miller could end up behind bars with women who, as a result, will be in serious danger. Instead of signalling their deranged progressive virtue, politicians like Sturgeon and Yousaf should hang their heads in shame. Does the SNP hate women? Does it really believe that the safety of women is less important than the alleged right of convicted rapists to pretend they're female? If so, the long-suffering people of Scotland must vote their irresponsible rulers out of office at the first available opportunity. Of course, the SNP has a few other problems on its hands as the police investigation into allegations of serious financial corruption continues apace. But possibly because of the supreme unchallenged power it has enjoyed for more than 15 years, the Party for Scottish Independence seems to have forgotten that women vote too. And for that alone, mark my words, it is riding for a fall. As are English politicians in the Westminster bubble, like Keir Starmer, who insists that only 99% of women don't have penises. So there are 1% who do? Of course they don't. Just like men can't get pregnant, all sane citizens of this great United Kingdom should rise up and demand an end to this madness. Trans women are not women. They're trans women who, like trans men, should absolutely be able to live their lives as they choose without harm or derision, but not at the expense of the right of women to be recognised as women, of the right of women not to be reduced to be dismissed as people with cervixes, not to be insultingly labelled people who menstruate, of the right of women to be called women. Let's call a halt to the NHS removing the words women and woman from its guidance on books on ovarian womb and cervical cancer and from its advice pamphlets on the menopause. Let's demand an end to the NHS's demented policy of asking men who are about to be x-rayed if they're pregnant, to which the only sensible answer has to be, let's see now, I'm a bloke. Take a wild guess. To respect women who are raped, let's have no more of the absurdity of lawyers in court having to spout nonsense like, she got out her penis. It's an insult to the victims of this dreadful crime and it's an insult to everyone's intelligence. Come on now, enough is enough. They're women, they're not people with cervixes, right? And I think the problem is, is that when you start to elevate the needs of one group, it pushes down yes, the needs yes, of another. Yes. And this is, I think, the problem a lot of women have is that you want to be, most of us, supportive of, like you just said, of trans men and women, of but course. not when it compromises the safety of other people and their well-being. Why can't we just have prisons for trans people? Why can't we just, you know, why is it that they have to compromise other people's safety to have their voices and their rights heard? And also, when you commit a crime like that, you shouldn't have any rights shouldn't have the right to ask other people to change for you. Whether you're a trans woman or a man, if you commit rape, in my opinion, your penis gets slubbed off. That's it. C credit off. That's your punishment. If, if I'm... I'll talk about driving again. These moments <laughs> where you shock me with your <laughs> extreme right-wing beliefs. <laughs> if, I'm dry, if I'm done for drink driving, my licence is taken away from me. So if you commit, if you commit the crime of rape, yeah. you take away your penis. It's yeah. that simple. But the problem is, is that if you are innocent and it's later to prove that you're innocent, then you just haven't got a penis well, no, anymore. Then, well, then you get an apology and a few oh, right. thousand yeah, pounds. Okay. Now you tell me. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's all you got? <laughs> I've got nothing left here. <laughs> um, but I, I do find, I find it very uncomfortable that, uh, you know, as I say, trans rights, uh, trans women, trans men should be called what they want to be called. I don't mind their pronouns if they want it, but not if we start cancelling words like women and woman yeah. and female. That's all wrong. It's not, it's sexist, I think. It is, but I think, thankfully, common sense is starting to prevail a little bit, and I think the pendulum is starting to swing back to actual common sense, yeah. and we're going to stop um, 
accommodating and being... Essentially, we're lying to everyone to accommodate a few people who think, oh, no, no, you, you can't call a woman a woman. Well, we can, because that's what women are. Women are women. <laughs> so that's what yeah. they should be called. Uh, you can solve problems by voting for politicians, and they have these campaigns to try and get your votes. And uh, this is what uh, the uh, guy who wanted to be governor of Mississippi, a guy called Tate Reeves, uh, this was his bid to uh, get the votes of the people of Mississippi. Uh, take it away, Tate. <laughs> Rebecca, I'm afraid that Tate's uh, charisma bypass operation was entirely <laughs> successful. Uh, would you vote for him? No, and I'm not sure it's a good look for someone like him being around all those kids on a basketball court. Exactly. It's well, just not acceptable. Exactly. We're being a bit unfair to Tate here. Yeah? I'm not making I'm just the playing basketball with some no. kids. It's the whole look. The hairstyle, the glasses, yeah, the charisma. Give him a break. And he's like, not hey, I'm still a court with some kids playing basketball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to sit around libeling Tate Reeves <laughs> like this. It looks to me to be a very fine, upstanding, if slightly uncharismatic <laughs> candidate uh, for the role of Mississippi. Can you spell Mississippi? Mrs. M, Mrs. I, Mrs. No, no, no. M I S S I S S I P P I. Oh, there you go. Well, well done. There Another go. gold star. Yeah, yeah. Well done. It's the only spelling I could ever do. <laughs> Nothing else. Uh, now, uh, it is time uh, for the best of bad TV. I think we've got a sting for it. Now, uh, this goes back to when I was a TV critic. I do remember it. It comes back to me in all of my nightmares. It was <laughs> Katie Price and Peter Andre. They were on Children in Need, performing their new single uh, from the uh, film Aladdin, the Disney film, A Whole New World. And it takes you into a whole new area of musical delight. So this is Katie Price s uh, singing <laughs> A Whole New World. Hit it, Katie. A whole new world. I never knew But now from way up here It's crystal clear But now I'm in a whole new world with you They said she oh. was talentless, so <laughs> she's wasted. Uh, let's hear some more of Katie and Peter uh, singing A Whole New World. <laughs> <laughs> a whole new world Don't you a hundred thousand things to see I'm like a shooting star I've come so far I can't go back to where I used to be Oh, it's just unbelievable isn't it, oh. Is That's that the worst duet you've ever heard? Oh. I think no, might. when she tried to do Eurovision as well yeah. She was actually worse then. Yeah. Oh. So among the many things, JJ, that uh, Katie Price can't do, singing is one of them. Clearly, there's no child in need that is so is in need <laughs> we have to be subjected to that. Is ever there again. no beginning to her talent? <laughs> there's definitely no beginning to her talent. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 why did this the BBC, right? Children, yeah, children yeah. in need of uh, earmuffs, so <laughs> yeah. they can't it hear it. It was for the deaf children. I mean, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Horrendous. But Peter Andre, credit to him, he still sings perfectly throughout it, which is a real talent. Did he not say, baby, sound amazing? Or what, did he have to lie to her? I guess so. Well, on that bum note, <laughs> uh, that very, very bum dud note, uh, that brings uh, to an end another fine episode of What Just Happened? <laughs> so uh, thank you to Katie Price. Please never sing again. Thank you very much to JJ Anasiobi, my regular, and to Rebecca Toomey, our debutant, and what a great performance by both of you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of What Just Happened? But now I'm in a whole new world with